Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for being here. May I begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land upon which we meet today, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and pay my and the court's respects to elders for their continuing work towards creating a more just society. We commit to, work, to walk with the greatest of respect on the Aboriginal land, and it is our hope that we may move to a place of equality, equity, partnership and reconciliation together. I acknowledge the presence of the Attorney-General for the Commonwealth of Australia, the Honourable Mark Dreyfus, <coughs> KCMP, the Honourable Michelle Gordon, AC, and the Honourable Justice Simon Stewart of the High Court of Australia. Judges of the Federal Circuit and Family Court of Australia Division 1, Judges of the Federal Circuit and Family Court of Australia Divisions 2, and Judges of the Federal Court of Australia. Judges of the Supreme Court of Victoria, County Court of Victoria, Magistrates Court of Victoria, and of course are, are many retired judges, including retired Justice the Honourable Ken Hain. Commissioner Tarang Chawla, the Victorian Multicultural Commissioner. Representatives of the Bar, the Profession, Legal Aid, Women's Legal Services, DFFH, Relationships Australia and so many other stakeholders and service providers that support our courts and the litigants that engage with us. And of course, our CEO and Principal Registrar, David Pringle, and perhaps one of our stars tonight, um, our filmmaker, Sally Ann Bell Harry. Thank you all for joining us the courts today to launch these new educational films centred on family violence. It is a good time to do it with the Commonwealth Government's launch last week of its first action, uh, action plan and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander action plan as part of the national plan, which includes a commitment to, tw to a 25% annual reduction in female victims of intimate partner homicide and an increase in the knowledge about family violence. Every single day, there are cases in our courts and in every state and territory court system that involve high-risk family violence. It is incumbent upon all of us every single day to consider how we can improve our response to family violence. There is a, a responsibility upon each of us to, to do what we can within our areas of responsibility to educate to inform and strive to eradicate this terrible scourge on our communities. In our courts, we see family violence in both parenting and financial matters. It affects parents, children, extended families and communities. It can occur prior to separation, during separation and continue after a relationship is broken down. In the parenting cases filed within our courts, the many thousands of parenting cases, family violence is alleged in 83% of those cases, child abuse in 72% of those cases, and drug and alcohol abuse in 55% of those cases. These figures are as shocking and unacceptable to, not just to our courts, but to our community as a whole. It needs to be clear to Australian families that our courts know and understand family violence. Our judges, our registrars, psychologists, social workers are experts. We need to communicate clearly what family violence is and how the courts will deal with it in parenting cases. We also need to demystify how the voice of children are heard by judges deciding who a child will live with or spend time with. These topics are of such importance, we decided to create short films about them to educate and inform the community and continue to, ch to change the conversation about family law. They build on a suite of presentations we have already created about how divorcing couples could separate smarter with the use of dispute resolution where it's appropriate and safe to do so. The preparation of these films has been a huge task and the culmination of expertise of our judges and staff with external experts on the front line, such as the women's legal groups and legal aid. In total, we consulted over 30 different stakeholders 
and on their advice, these films are animated. This has helped to ensure that they are clear, easy to understand and respectful without being re-traumatising. They're also available in Auslan to, in to increase availability and accessibility. Many of the stakeholders that assisted in preparation of these films are present or watching online, including the women's legal groups nationally. And I want to sincerely thank them for their help and input. To mention a few, Liz Snell and Pip Davis of the Women's Legal Services New South Wales, Caitlin Willoughby, Weatherby Fell from Top End uh, Legal Service in Northern Territory, Yvette uh, Seatel from Women's Legal Services Tasmania, Byron Freeland from Women's Legal Services Australia, Helen Matthews and, and Sharon uh, Rayner from L Women's Legal Services Victoria, Angela Lynch and Nala Bromley from Legal Services Queensland, and of course, Hayley Foster, now of our court. The better we communicate, the better outcomes we will have for all Australian families. The more certainty we create about the legal process, the more we'll be able to reduce the stress and the difficulty faced by litigants in some of the most stressful times in their lives. It also means the courts can create clear expectations about the information we need to know and why it is so very important that we need to know about family violence at the earliest opportunity in the courts. Through early identification, it can be appropriately managed. These films are another constructive step in our journey to address family violence, of course, after it occurs. This includes our Lighthouse Project, our world-leading risk screening process that ensures family law cases are managed in accordance with the risks that present and that high-risk family violence is referred to appropriate support services. This week, the courts have also launched an update of the Family Violence Plan, best practice principles that guide the way the courts respond to family violence and ensure that physical and emotional safety of litigants. The overarching principles included in that Family Violence Plan ensure and point out that family violence is unacceptable. Safety is a right and a priority for all court users and that all professionals working in the family law system are expected to undertake ongoing training to ensure they have a sound and contemporary knowledge of family violence. We are committed as courts to doing what we can to reduce the terrible impacts of, on vulnerable people and children in our communities. The Attorney General with his presence has clearly demonstrated his commitment, his ongoing commitment, not only to our courts, but to the eradication of family violence. Now, with respect, it's not just the responsibility of courts or government. It's the responsibility of everyone in our community, brothers, sisters, employers, teachers, sports people and leaders in our community, all those in our community to have a unified stance against family violence, saying enough is enough. I look forward to continuing the conversation about family violence and I thank each of you for joining us here today to launch our short films which will help to communicate the real importance and the information needed by the community in relation to family violence. I now invite the Attorney General to address us. Good afternoon, and thanks very much for the introduction, Chief Justice. Can I begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet today, the Rwandari people of the Kulin Nation, and pay my respects to their elders past and present. I extend that respect to other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples who are with us today. I'm very pleased to welcome you to the launch of these three short films, and I take this opportunity to acknowledge the filmmaker, Sal Balberry, who is with us here this afternoon. And I also acknowledge the distinguished members of the judiciary and the legal profession who are present as well as the many representatives from Family Violence Support Services attending today. Thank you, Chief Justice, and to the Federal Circuit and Family Court of Australia for the invitation to address this event and to uh, attend today. The Albanese government is committed to ensuring that the family law system is safe, accessible, simple to use, and delivers justice and fairness to all Australians. While the legal system and its complexities are familiar for those of us who are exposed to it daily, for families, 
it can be an overwhelmingly complex and confusing system to navigate. And for those experiencing family violence, which as the Chief Justice has said, is all too many people, they are often doing so in the most complex and challenging circumstances of their lives. When people are unable to fully engage with a system they do not understand, their ability to assert their rights, protect their interests and advocate for themselves is compromised. And their experience in the system can become more traumatic than it needs to be. The films we will watch today cover the important topics of family violence, court processes and children's voices in family law proceedings. They provide relevant and important information for individuals navigating the family law system and provide clarity around topics where there is uncertainty or confusion. They help support people's engagement with and understanding of our legal system. The Albanese government is committed to ensuring those working within the legal system have the knowledge and resources they need to support vulnerable individuals. As the Chief Justice has observed, the, uh, just last week, the government has released the first action plan of the National Plan to End Violence Against Women and Children 2022 to 2032, with a focus on reducing and ultimately ending the pervasive rates of family, domestic and sexual violence in communities across the nation. Our national plan supports a nationally coordinated approach to education and training on family, domestic and sexual violence for community frontline workers, for health professionals and for the justice sector. That includes funding for the Australasian Institute of Judicial Administration for the ongoing maintenance of the National Domestic and Family Violence Bench Book, uh, funding for the National Judicial College of Australia for the continued development and del delivery of the Family Violence in the Court training program and development and delivery of continuing professional development training for legal practitioners on coercive control. As I'm sure you'll all agree, the Bench Book is an invaluable resource for judicial officers and legal practitioners alike because it promotes best practice develops consistency in judicial decision-making and improves court experiences for victim survivors. Building on the bench book, the Family Violence in Court Training Program familiarises judicial officers with the bench book and promotes consistency in the interpretation and application of laws relevant to family violence across jurisdictions. This training can be, and indeed has been, tailored to meet the specific needs of each jurisdiction. In June, my department released a discussion paper seeking feedback from stakeholders to inform the design of the grant opportunity for the coercive control training measure for legal practitioners. We've received a total of 41 submissions and my department will shortly start working with the Community Grants Hub on the design of the grant opportunity guidelines for this important training measure. In addition to these funded measures, the Standing Council of Attorneys General has been progressing work to embed family safety competency in continuing professional development. Keeping children and families safe is at the heart of the family law system. As you are most of you, I think, probably aware, in March I introduced a long overdue Family Law Amendment Bill 2023. The bill will make the family law system simpler and safer for separating families and their children will address confusing and overly complex drafting resulting from decades of piecemeal change to the Family Law Act 1975. The bill introduces critical changes to the legal framework for making parenting orders. It will repeal the presumption of equal shared parental responsibility and the requirement for a court to consider significant and substantial time with a parent. Numerous inquiries have found that these provisions are convoluted and widely misunderstood. It means that parents negotiating outside the court can be led into arrangements that may not be safe or appropriate for children. The Act will continue to recognise the importance of children having a relationship with both their parents where it is safe to do so. The Bill considers the best interests of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children 
to emphasise the importance of keeping a connection to culture. The bill also introduces amendments to require independent children's lawyers to meet with children and provide them the opportunity to express any view about the proceedings. There are, of course, some exceptions to this requirement to ensure that the child's safety or well-being is prioritised. It is imperative that children not only have the right to freely express views about matters and decisions that affect them, but also that their voices are heard. These amendments support children's rights under Article 12 of the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child while ensuring their safety and well-being. The bill also proposes the removal of the exceptional circumstances requirement for the appointment of an ICL in matters concerning the Convention on the Civil Aspects of International Child Abduction. This change will provide greater opportunity for a child's views to be heard and considered during aid convention proceedings. Many victim survivors of family violence and their children suffer the effects of continued abuse by their perpetrators through the misuse of legal processes. To address, it, uh, to address a gap in the current law, the bill will give an additional power to the family law courts to restrain a party from engaging in repeated litigation by making a harmful proceedings order. The focus of the measure is on the protection of the other party and any children from harm, including the detrimental effect on the other party's capacity to care for a child. Once this order is in place, any further proposed proceedings would first be assessed by the court to ensure that the matters that are vexatious, frivolous or unlikely to be successful are not being heard. This will be done in a way that ensures principles of procedural fairness are adhered to. It's important that the family law courts have the best possible evidence before them when considering what parenting orders to make. A family report prepared by a social science professional is a critical piece of evidence that needs to be available to assist the court. The bill will establish a power for government to prescribe standards and requirements for these professionals. It's crucial that families, the court, and all those involved in the family law system have confidence that every family report has been prepared by a professional with the skills and knowledge required to undertake this important task. Measures in the Family Law Amendment Information Sharing Bill 2023, which is also before the Parliament, will ensure the court has access to critical child abuse, neglect, and family violence information to make decisions that are in the best interests of children. We must all work together to ensure that the family law system is accessible, safe, properly resourced, and simpler to use to ensure the safety of children and families as they navigate this system. The films that we are going to be shown shortly provide vital information to those families and to the broader public and empower those families with the knowledge necessary to better advocate for themselves and their children. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Attorney General. Can I now um, introduce uh, Terang Twala, a commissioner at the Victorian Multicultural Commission. Terang is a writer, uh, anti-violence campaigner, mental health and gender equality advocate and sessional academic. Rang is also the co-founder of Not One More Nikki, a campaign to end violence against women in culturally diverse communities, named after his, his younger sister, Nikki, who was murdered in 2015. Ladies and gentlemen, the Commissioner. Thank you, uh, Chief Justice. Uh, I too want to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and pay my respects to elders past and present, and also pay my respects to any Aboriginal and First Nations people that are in the room today, uh, and acknowledge uh, their continuing cultures and connection to land and sea. Uh, I also want to acknowledge in doing so the disproportionate impact that uh, domestic and family violence has on First Nations communities who are um, quite literally overrepresented compared to the rest of the Australian population and something that we need to work towards in terms of closing the gap. 
Uh, I also want to acknowledge the very many members of the esteemed judiciary who are here today. It was uh, lovely to hear the name Michelle Gordon mentioned. Um, she just Gordon won't remember me, but I interviewed her in 2015 um, when she was then appointed to the federal court. Um, she won't remember, but I'm going to catch her afterwards um, and uh, and uh, um, see how she's how she's doing. Um, uh, and thank you, Chief Justice, of course, for the the uh, lovely introduction and the invitation here, as well as acknowledging uh, the very many members of the family violence sector who are present today. Uh, and most significantly acknowledge victim survivors of domestic abuse and family violence, those that are present in the room, those on the live stream, and sadly, those who we have lost. Where to begin? You know, a speech on domestic abuse and family violence. 44 women have been allegedly murdered thus far, um, and we're in August. 44 women have been killed, um, allegedly murdered, as well as nine children on top of that figure. Um, and 40 of those 44 all allegedly murdered by a man that they knew, a man that they were either in a relationship with, a man that they had left a relationship with, or a man that they were trying to escape from. Just a couple of weeks ago, we had four women die in the space of a week. And you wouldn't know unless you were paying attention because it wasn't on the front page of the news. It wasn't plastered over the Sydney Morning Herald or the Age or the Times. It wasn't anywhere to be seen, but somewhere nestled deep on page 17. And so I want to speak to you today about the importance of, of preventing something that is very dear to me and to my family and, of course, that's uh, very close to my heart and something that I've spent the best part of the last decade working towards. Uh, I don't want to focus on statistics. I want to focus on the importance of education and what these films represent to families who've lost a loved one, as well as uh, talk about how important it is that we all work collectively to end this scourge of domestic abuse and family violence. And if I may say so, men's violence. You know, when we talk about family violence, we're often talking about men as perpetrators of violence. This is an issue that uh, makes news, thankfully, and thanks to the work of many in this room and around this country, uh, it, it's something that people are caring about in a way that for decades was often ignored. It's something that uh, my family lives with the effects of uh, every day. You know, we talk about my late sister, Nikki, fondly, and we remember her. I told you just a moment ago about 40 women 40 plus women who've lost their lives or rather whose lives were taken from them. I gave a speech to a room full of lawyers in Sydney in May and that number had just ticked over 20. So in the last three months, we doubled that homicide rate in Australia. And that means that nearly 20 people in the last few months made a decision to end the life of someone else, someone that they should have been able to trust, to love, to comfort them, or someone that they should have been able to leave safely. And so every year there's a new number. Every week there's a new figure on that rising death toll. And so today I won't talk about the statistics because you know them or I'd encourage you if you don't already to seek out that information. And I'm sure that whether it's Hayley Foster here at the court who has had such a, an important contribution to the sector over many, many years, who now works in the court, um, will be able to assist you or many others. For me, I want to talk about the human cost. Because for families like mine, they're not statistics. The women that are lost are never going to be just a figure. They're real human beings that we miss daily. And as the Chief Justice alluded to, my little sister, Nikki, was murdered in January 2015. She was the first domestic violence homicide uh, victim that year. We'd barely had time to make, let alone break, our New Year's resolutions when one week into the year uh, she was murdered in the middle of the night. She was and now always will be just 23. In fact, it would have been Nikki's birthday in June and instead of blowing out the candles on a birthday cake, instead of spending a weekend together, or doing quite literally whatever she wanted with her family and friends instead of pursuing hopes and dreams. Nikki, like those 44 other women this year, like the dozens of women every year, isn't here. But let me tell you a bit about us and how we came to be in this wonderful country of Australia. 
Do you remember when uh, politicians and there's, there's a couple in the room that remember when politicians referred to um, those who came here by boat as boat people? Well, my um, my mum always found that really funny. She, um, she said, "Why are we worrying about how people got here? They're here now, right? That's what matters." And so she'd proudly tell anyone who'd listen our family story. She'd talk about being proud plain people. <laughs> and if you've ever flown Air India, you will know that you'd rather be on any boat, no matter how uh, how unsafe it might look, because it's safer and definitely more efficient. But I digress. <laughs> We arrived with two suitcases, $100 of paper money before Australia had made the move to polymer notes, and I had my little Ventolin asthma puffer. And we grew up in the outer southeastern suburbs of Melbourne, where racism, regrettably, was commonplace, and the open expanses and familiarity of the uh, soon-opening Indian shops meant that it's where my parents settled. This was back in the late 1980s, before Instagram, TikTok, and whatever the kids are using now. But uh, before all of that, my parents had to use a rotary phone to dial home in India. And it cost $5 a minute. And I don't even want to know what that figure would be now adjusted for inflation. But uh, as you can imagine, phone calls back home for my parents were kept very, very short. We'd write letters instead to my extended family in India. And as we waited weeks in between each reply, we grew to love our new city. And in time, Melbourne came to be home. I had childhood memories, fond ones, of assimilating to the so-called Aussie way of life. My dad would take me to the footy and I was raised Hindu, so he'd tell me, I'm going to let you eat a meat pie, but don't tell your mum <laughs> that I did. And so I sat in the nosebleed section of the Great Southern Stand, now the Shane Warne Stand, and I managed to spill a meat pie all down my shirt. <laughs> and on the train ride home, as my dad anxiously worried about what situation he'd have to uh, answer to at home, I said, Dad, this is the best day of my life. <laughs> as a child, my grandfather, who was in Delhi, would write me letters and I would write back. And then he would send letters back. But in those letters, he would also include the letter that I had originally written to him, meticulously marked in red pen with corrections. <laughs> he was insistent that I learn the then Queen's English and not whatever Australian offshoot I was being taught at school. But childhood was filled with countless silly memories of adjusting to life in Australia, such as when Dad went to Woolworths and he went to aisle 14 and been told by all his friends at his job to try Vegemite. And he bought it and he brought it home and he opened it and he went, smells funny, I'm going to take it back. <laughs> so he took it back. And the man working in R14 was a recent migrant from Istanbul in Turkey. And he took a whiff and he said, oh, I'm so sorry, sir. Woolworths has sold you an expired product. <laughs> and so they stood there, two five feet nine inches men of colour standing in R14 at Woolworths, opening jar after jar after jar after Vegemite. <laughs> All within day, but somehow all expired. <laughs> but childhood was loving, fulfilling, and despite the occasional instances of racism, it was so much fun. It was footy in winter, cricket in summer, but as you'd know, members of the judiciary or anyone from a South Asian background, homework in summer, winter, weekends, all the time. <laughs> my migrant parents had instilled in my sister and I the importance of an education, and so we learned to love learning as children. And it was that promise of a better, safer and happier future that brought them into Australia in their 20s. I mean, we have to think when people move to this great nation of ours, what would compel someone well into adulthood to get up and uproot everything, not knowing what's going to wait for them on the other side, and particularly before all of the modern uh, conveniences and before modern technology made it possible to zoom in onto the street you're going to live on Google Earth, they had no concept of what awaited them. But years passed for my little sister Nikki and I, and we grew up side by side as brother and sister. I remember being the proud older brother watching her flourish in her creative endeavours. She was a performing artist, and I felt so very proud of her achievements. At the age of 18, while studying an accounting degree, she started her own business. Uh, in a few years, she'd become the supporting, uh, sorry, the opening act for the, the support group uh, that uh, toured for 10 years with Michael Bublé. And uh, recently we got to go to his concert and, and meet him and he had fond memories that he was sharing of, of my sister. And it's always strange hearing about family members and particularly siblings from, uh, 
from people that you hold in high esteem because to them they're your you know rascal sibling and yet you're hearing all these great things about them that it doesn't quite compute I took the conventional path. I didn't start any businesses. I studied arts and law at the University of Melbourne. And uh, I thought that one day I would become a lawyer. And I was telling the Chief Justice we met at the football a few months ago that uh, I got admitted to practice. But as it turns out, uh, I'm better at watching Law and & Order. And I think I've seen every episode. Uh, uh, and, and that was more my skill set than a life in the law. But... Uh, my 20s and, and Nikita's early 20s were happy, or at least that's what I thought for her. But I didn't know the family violence that she was living in, and I didn't know the situation that she endured on a daily basis. And so men's violence against women changed things for my family, uh, for us, and in the most final of ways for my baby sister, Nikki. She had her life taken from her. And I remember my family's life changing in a heartbeat with a knock on the door from two Victoria police officers that come to tell us this terrible news that Nikki had been murdered overnight. And so Nikki's untimely death marked the end of an abusive and controlling relationship where she suffered needlessly at the hands of a violent and possessive individual. But the reality of Nikki's life, not her death, is that she shouldn't ever have been killed. People tell me that they know Nikki's story and yet they don't. They know the story of the man who chose to end her life. Her story is the 23 years and the lifetime of love that we have for her. And the saddest part is that Nikki's story of dying at the hands of a violent perpetrator is one that is far too common in this country. See, Nikki died um, after being ambushed while she slept by a man armed with a meat cleaver and far superior physical strength. And the medical autopsy report from the Victorian Coroner's Court um, said that she'd sustained no fewer than 35 separate stab wounds in her attack. <clears throat> and I remember three days after her death having to go to the coroner's court in South Melbourne and uh, identify what was left of uh, her. You know, identify that the, the cold, lifeless corpse lying on the stainless steel table was, in fact, the sister with the precocious energy, the tapping feet and the smile and the unmistakably long black, thick curly hair and it was in fact her hair that allowed me to identify what was left of her. It's a sad reality of my life that signing that particular piece of paper in the coroner's court is one of the most important pieces of paper that I'll ever have to sign in my life and it's something that I wouldn't wish on anyone. And so when we talk about family violence and domestic abuse and men's violence, we know that these deaths under such horrific circumstances are tragic and cruel. And we have to admit, as I do, that in some moments, I foolishly thought that Nikki was immune. She was intelligent, driven, ambitious, creative. I thought, how could family violence possibly impact her? She had career goals. My parents had a relationship modelled on equality and respect. And Nikki had the promise of a blossoming future, but violence doesn't discriminate. And the sad reality is that everything I'm telling you now is one anecdote of many, many families across Australia. And so we must remind ourselves that family violence knows no boundaries of geography, of wealth, of culture, sexuality or religion. And to put those numbers into perspective, the only statistic I'll mention is that one in six Australian women and one in 16 men are directly impacted by family and domestic violence. And so this is why I was ready to accept the invitation from the Chief Justice to speak today. And I'm heartened to have the Attorney General here, and I'm especially heartened when he talks about the Albanese government's commitment to this, because for too long we did have a government installed that would turn a blind eye to this issue. And I think that this is the kind of issue that requires bipartisan support. This is the kind of issue that requires everyone to acknowledge that this is not about which side of politics you're on or what you believe or what your views are on money or any other issue. This is about the basic dignity and human right of everyone to live safely in their home and free from violence. And I was also tremendously grateful to accept the invitation today because for too long, this nation's institutions have been lacking in their commitment to this issue. And so for the Chief Justice to host a launch of films and for Sal to make these films and to be commissioned to make them 
is a sign of progress and a sign of change. Because when it comes to this, this issue, there are many, many numbers thrown about. These statistics will get brought up, but statistics don't change hearts and minds. It's the human experience that binds us and it's the human experience that's been taken away from people every time a man makes a decision to end the life of someone that should have been able to trust him. You know, when I think of Nikki, I'm reminded of one thing. I'm reminded that with every victim, there's a story and with every death, a legacy. And as I watch these videos, as you'll have the opportunity to watch today, these videos humanize the issue. They're animated, which makes it accessible to everyone of all ages. They're available in Auslan, as the Chief Justice said. These are videos that are designed to make education the most important part of ending this scourge. There are many people, regrettably, who still live under the preconceived notion that what they're experiencing is not domestic abuse or family violence, or men who are engaging in behaviour that they're not aware is domestic abuse or family violence, and who can be helped if we're open to supporting them. And so I encourage you to watch them today, but more importantly, to share them widely, to refer to them in your work, uh, to share them with your peers, and to start these conversations, because it is through these conversations that we will save lives. We all play a key role in eradicating domestic abuse and family violence in this country, and that starts with education. Thank you. Thank you very much, Frank, for that fantastic speech. Um, I now invite Ms Hayley Foster, um, the appointed director of the F Family Violence and Indigenous Programs, to share her perspectives. She's a recognised leader and authority voice in family domestic and sexual violence over the last 20 years. Experience in uh, generating positive change within business community and government settings. Most recently, held, Haley held the position as Chief Executive Officer of Full Stop Australia. Haley. Thank you, Chief. Um, I too would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land upon which we meet today, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, Kulin Nation, and pay my deepest respects to Elders past, present and emerging. Uh, I'd also like to pay my respects to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are here with us today, uh, particularly Kirsty Malin, um, who heads up our Indigenous family liaison offices across the country and is playing there you are, a, a critical role as well in making sure that this court um, is accessible and as culturally safe and sensitive as possible as well to the community. So thank you. Um, I'd like to thank uh, the Chief Justice uh, and, uh, look, I was going to um, start naming uh, justices in the room, but esteemed justices and judges, um, the Honourable Attorney General, thank you, Mark, um, Mark Dreyfus, for um, being with us. It's very, very special to have you here as well. Um, and David Pringle um, and the amazing team that I've gotten to know over the last few weeks. I've been here, I think this is the um, beginning of my third week with the court, um, and I'm, I'm very, very grateful for the opportunity to step in at this, um, what feels like a very magical moment of change. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge uh, Tarang for that amazing um, address. Um, every time I hear you speak, um, my um, I'm not sure I'm not alone in, um, in having goosebumps and tingling and, um, and being deeply impacted by your story. Um, I, th I think, and you know, I want to acknowledge all the other survivors in the room and all the survivors who have um, been so incredibly generous in sharing your stories, and not because of any other reason except you feel, and we've spoke about this before, you feel compelled, um, you feel a sense of responsibility, you can't unsee this stuff. Um, and I think that that's what brings all of us in this room. And I, I want to acknowledge everybody in this room for the, for the enormous contribution you make. You, you're here because you're committed, you're here because of the work you're doing every single day. You see this stuff um, and you want to see a change. Um, so I do want to acknowledge um, any people with lived experience in the room. We know that there will be many. Um, I also want to acknowledge the profession, the profession, uh, government, sector, family violence, uh, sexual violence leaders, um, and all of you working in the court. Um, thank you for your remarkable contribution. We're so grateful. I think um, 
there are moments like this um, that we have to just take a pause and we have to acknowledge um, when we've done something collectively together. This stuff is hard every day, seeing this stuff, dealing with this stuff. Um, and we're out, we are doing everything we're doing. I know that I've been in the last few weeks talking to members of the court and, and um, staff right throughout um, about the tremendous responsibility felt um, and the limitations of the system, of course, that we have and an evidence-based system. And um, we're all trying to do the best we can and those decisions weigh so greatly on us. And so it's so important when we come together and make this commitment, um, whether it be through funding, whether it be through policy, whether it be through leadership um, in the organisation, and, and, and take a moment to celebrate when we've done something that's going to make a difference. And I think that's what we're here today to do. Um, Sal is a remarkable um, artist. And um, not only that, the way that she was able to communicate um, and listen and invite feedback from everybody that needed to be um, consulted from all different aspects and perspectives. And I think that's what makes this make, is going to make this cut through. Um, so, look, I'm delighted to be here. I, I do want us to take a moment to appreciate this, um, that we've, we've done something that's going to make a difference. It's going to make this um, court and the process much more accessible. We know that um, it can be tremendously um, daunting. Um, it can be extremely um, distressing to be uh, going through a court process, to be going through any family separation, let alone within the context of family violence. And we know that the risk is dramatically higher as a result. Uh, and so part of a trauma-informed approach, a very important part of that, is making sure that we're really clear about what to expect. People know um, what they're in for, what they know what um, is going to happen when they set foot in the door. And now they know that there's a whole range of uh, changes and systems and, and mechanisms we're putting in place to not only create as much physical safety as possible when someone's going through this process, but also psychological safety um, through the process. And so um, with that in mind, um, I, I think when I look at these videos, the number one thing that comes out is that um, the family court, um, the family courts, uh, the Federal Circuit and Family Court of Australia, uh, takes this issue very seriously and it is a, a, a paramount consideration um, around the safety of children not only the safety of children the safety of adults impacted by family violence um, when you come to the court you will be listened to you will be taken seriously and you will be offered support um, and that is absolutely critical and and i think we should take this moment to kind of recognize that um, so look i'm not going to go on without further ado i think um we can see the videos will speak for themselves. Um, but, you know, I, I hope you enjoy them and I hope that you share them. This is probably my main message. Please share them widely <laughs> through the entire, through the profession, through the sector, through the community, uh, through particular um, community groups that you have a connection with. Um, please share them widely because um, these these aim to um, not only educate but to empower. Um, and, and I think that that's something that we can all take away. So thank you very much. I now I'll ask to uh, explain the films and to show them to you, uh, our filmmaker, celebrated filmmaker, <laughs> Sal Bellaharry. Um, when I first asked Sal to take on this project, it could have gone horribly wrong. It hasn't. <laughs> I'm very grateful. Um, and Sal, you've done a fantastic job. Sal Bellaharry. Uh, you can rest assured we will get to see these films. <laughs> Eventually. So, yes, thank you, Chief. Thank you, Attorney General. I'm Sel Bell Harry. I'm a writer and film director, but most importantly, I'm a storyteller who, by some fluke of birth, has the good fortune to work and create on the lands of the Wurundjeri people, where continuous storytelling has taken place for 65,000 years before me. And I'm incredibly grateful for my opportunity to add to the canon of Aussie stories. Um, I'm delighted and humbled to have been asked to say a few words about the making of these very short but mighty, powerful films. Um, I truly believe in the ability of storytelling to change lives and to open minds. I don't think anybody who's been in this room today and had the opportunity to listen to Tarang's story will ever forget or be able to lose that visual that you have in the mind of that young man being asked to sign that paper. I find that an overwhelming um, moment, and that's the power of story. I love my job, 
and I love leading teams on projects with very smart people. And this team had incredibly smart brains inside it. And I love using film to change. But I really wish that I didn't have to be here today and I wish that I didn't have to introduce these films. I wish none of us had to be here. But until the violence stops, we do. And here we are. And my hope is that these films will truly hope, help people in their most desperate, their saddest, their most stressed moment. I hope that these films shine a light of hope and suggest that there is a way forward and that there are steps that can be taken and that there are people out there who can help others. We live in a world where screens and content shape our every day. Google has become our doctor, our teacher. It's become our news source. And this is because we can search information on our own terms in our own time frame. In 2021, I was employed by the court who had embraced film as a medium. And this is incredibly exciting because what it means is that information is being packaged. It's not just the 3,000 pages of content that exists on the FCFCOA website. What we're doing is taking huge chunks of information and distilling it down into its absolute most basic form so it can be accessed by anyone at any time. And we know that this works. Uh, on our YouTube channel, tens of thousands of people are viewing information. And most importantly, they're arriving at court with a greater understanding of process and outcome. Today, we're about to launch three new animations that add to our important library. And this is on the topic of family violence. We created three films. The brief was to keep them under five minutes, and that was an incredibly difficult task. But the topics are what is family violence in the eyes of the court? How is the voice of the child heard? And what is the court process? And I'd like to take a moment to share with you how these films were made. From the get-go, the approach was to invite and listen to as many experts inside and outside of the court, from the Chief Justice and CEO David Pringle to the CEOs of women's legal services in every state and territory, to key advocates of groups active in the space. That was where I first met Haley. For over 12 months, I led 27 meetings and conducted 42 interviews. Consultation with these people took place over multiple points. It wasn't just a case of engagement at the end. We wanted people to be involved throughout the journey, throughout the making of these films. And so we had numerous feedback sessions from start to finish. We had major debates over the concept. In fact, in this room with many people on the call, live action versus animation. Does animation run the risk of oversimplifying a very complex conversation? Does live action convey greater levity? Which is more triggering? Consultation led to this outcome that animation offers us a greater opportunity to convey both diversity on screen and nuance of situations, but in regards to depicting harmful or triggering situations, animation removes the obvious nature of live action drama. And our need, though, was to not shirk from the realities of the topic, but to handle them with extreme care. And it was many of the external consultants who really urged and pushed us to understand, pushed is probably not a very good word in this, uh, in this context. <laughs> I'd like to take a deeper dive into the concept of inclusion because the need to be inclusive consistently sat at the heart of this project. And I don't wish to personalise, however, as the sister of a deaf brother, I was thrilled when the court highlighted the need for Auslan and how this might be tackled in animation. Because if you think about it, it's kind of strange to have somebody signing in the corner to an animated, what we call a puppet on screen. But then there's also the concept that deaf people can read. So why not just have text on screen? Because it's incredibly important to understand that Auslan shares not just words, but the level of emotion that is missed from understanding the spoken word. And so we placed an Auslan interpreter into an animated environment. And I found myself directing um, behind the camera uh, an, an Auslan interpreter. And that was an unusual skill set I for me. <laughs> anyway, um, and we placed her into the environment, um, the, the animated environment, which was able to, to depict a highly emotive topic. I'm incredibly proud of these films and incredibly proud of the team that I'm a part of here at the court and also the ability to work with the best animators 
Tristan's in the room today, who worked with me on these animations. And so until the day that we no longer need these films, I'm thrilled that they are now in the public domain, that they are avail available. And yes, of course, we invite you to share. And I truly hope they help the Nickies of this world to understand the steps that they can take to um, change their own outcomes. Thank you. The following animation may contain triggers for people experiencing safety issues or family violence. If you or someone you are with is in immediate danger, call triple zero. Remember, you can leave this website quickly using the quick exit button to your right. Family violence is not okay, but unfortunately it is a serious problem in our community. Four <coughs> out of every five cases we see here at the court involve allegations of family violence. The Federal Circuit and Family Court of Australia deals with families and relationships, and the focus of this video is family violence. So, what is family violence? Family violence is violent, threatening, or other behaviour that controls a family member or causes them to be fearful. It includes behaviours such as assault, stalking, or intentionally damaging or destroying property. Not all violence is physical. Family violence can include controlling a person's money or what they wear, making someone feel like they're crazy, cutting them off from family or friends, or making someone feel like they are a hostage in their own home. These actions or patterns of behavior are called coercive control and may indicate that you are in a serious or harmful situation. Family violence impacts everyone in the family including children. While it may look different in every family and every community, it's the court's duty to take it seriously and prioritize the safety of all affected. Separating from your partner can be a particularly dangerous time. So before you step foot in court, it can be really helpful to reach out to specialist family violence services and place a support team around you. You will need legal advice and support. If you need emotional support or want to find a local service, call 1800 RESPECT. If you need legal help or support with a family law issue, call the Family Advocacy and Support Service in your location. You can find more information at this website. Depending on the type and seriousness of the risks you are facing, your case may be managed differently in accordance with those risks. If you have experienced or are experiencing family violence, you are not alone. The court is here to work with you and will prioritise your safety and that of your children. However, you need to tell us about the family violence, risks and your safety concerns. We know you may be fearful about attending court, but remember that the court can put in place steps to help address your concerns. This may include creating a safety plan if required, which could allow you to wait in a safe room, use a separate entrance and or exit point, or allow you to attend court electronically. If you're engaging in the types of violent behaviours described in this video, there is support available at knowtoviolence.org and the Family Advocacy and Support Service. If you know someone experiencing family violence, Remember that bringing an end to it is a shared responsibility. It's up to all of us to call it out. The court takes family violence very seriously because family violence is never okay. Make sure to watch our other videos to understand more about family violence and the court process. You can find more helpful information and links on the FC FCOA website. The following animation may contain triggers for people experiencing safety issues or family violence. If you or someone you are with is in immediate danger, call triple zero. Remember, you can leave this website quickly using the quick exit button to your right. Family violence 
is a serious social issue that affects everyone in a family. The Federal Circuit and Family Court of Australia takes family violence very seriously. This video is for parents who may be unsure about how their child's voice will be considered in a family law matter. The court process is designed to balance the need to protect children from parental conflict with the child's right to have a voice in decisions being made about them. As children do not appear in court, the court uses a range of ways to gather important information from a wide range of sources. This is information that will help a judge or registrar make decisions that are in the best interests of your child. For example, depending on the level of information and risk, an order may be made for your child to meet with an independent children's lawyer or a child expert. So what is an independent children's lawyer and what do they do? An independent children's lawyer, or ICL, is appointed by the court. If appointed, an ICL will present information to the court about your child's welfare and views to help a judge determine what arrangements are in their best interests. Your child might also meet with a child expert. This person is usually a social worker or psychologist with specialist knowledge in what children need when their parents are in conflict. They may organise to meet with your child and to observe the way they interact with you and with their other parent. Every child is different, so these experts will ensure that all interactions with your child are appropriate for their age, maturity and family situation. A child expert may also speak to other people in your child's life such as teachers or grandparents. A report will then be prepared. This is an independent family assessment to assist you and the court in making decisions about your child. Let your child know that it is okay to speak freely with the ICL or child expert. Do not try to influence what your child might say. And remember, not all children want to engage so it's important that your child does not feel pressure to express a particular view. Here at court, safety is the highest priority. It's important to understand that there are options, such as using a safe room or attending court electronically. If you have any concerns about your safety or the safety of your child, let the court know before attending. There are also services such as the Family Advocacy Support Service who can provide free legal advice and support for people in your situation. Everyone has the right to feel safe and to live free from violence. Your child's voice is important. And remember, family violence is never okay. Make sure to watch our other videos to understand more about family violence and the court process. You can find more helpful information and links on the FC FCOA website.